So that's a little bit of the dynamic we'll have today. Um, this forum, the Stop Bidiaco Forum, is an open gathering of scholar practitioners who are committed to a thing the urgent realities of our world in light of the message of the gospel as we engage our local and global context and commit ourselves to a holistic understanding of the gospel. Following those who've gone before us, we seek to provide space for dialoguing, community, fellowship from all over the world. Um, and respect, ref we see this as a process, not an event, a conversation and not a final word. And specifically this year, we've been talking about peace building and conflict transformation from a lens of post-colonialism and indigenous Christianity, because we believe it's important to approach our discussions from this particular lens, precisely because historical and contemporary colonialism underlie and define many of the conflicts and injustices we see today. It's only by centering the voices and perspectives of the marginalized and learning from diverse interpretations of scripture, especially those offered by our indigenous brothers and sisters, can we engage faithfully in processes of relearning, peace building and transforming conflict. So with without further ado again and hear a little more from Shadia and Tony, first let me share with you a little bit about who they are. Shadia, if you want to just raise your hand so people know who you who you are with us. Um, she is um, from Nazareth in um, Israel, Palestine. She's worked for 15 years in peace building and advocacy initiatives through local and international organizations in Israel and Palestine. As a Palestinian, really focused on the voices and perspectives of women and other minorities in a variety of ways one of which she's done through um, a fabulous podcast called The Women Behind the Wall. I encourage you, encourage you all to listen to it. We'll surely share the link a little later on. Um, born and raised in Nazareth, Shadia studied international relations and the English language at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She also studied conflict re resolution and nonviolent action at Trinity Dublin College in Ireland. And she's currently in Vancouver, Canada, pursuing her degree in interreligious and indigenous studies. We're excited to hear from you, Shadia, as well as to hear from Tony. See you there in the camera. Um, Tony is a member of the Networking Team of Infinite. He's a young Palestinian theologian who's been ministering in different capacities in East Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America for the last 10 years. His passion revolves around scripture and the majority world biblical interpretations that take today's socio-political context into serious consideration. Tony currently lectures in biblical studies online uh, with biblical, Bethlehem Bible College, and he's pursuing a PhD in New Testament studies at the University of Aberdeen. He and his wife currently live in, in Bolivia with their three-year-old daughter, Nor Sophia. We're excited to see you both. Uh, I don't know if you want to just open your mics really quick and give us a greeting, um, and then we'll jump in and share prepared for today. Hello, everyone. Thank you hello. for being with us. Looking forward to this conversation. Yes, hello, everyone. Great to be here and looking forward to our conversation today. Wonderful. Well, um, Nina is, is going to share, uh, and then she gets that. Um, I also want to mention for those who just joined us, please do send in your uh, any questions that come up for you as we engage today. And if you are a Spanish speaker and want to listen in Spanish, you can go to the Spanish channel in uh, the bottom right corner of the all right, you know. Let me uh, let me be the troublemaker here and problematize a little bit the the notion of peace. Um, when I first joined Infinite as a uh, networking team member, 
I was asked to to write a blog article for a for a famous for a well known progressive evangelical American blog, and uh, when I when I wrote about, I, I, uh, I chose to write about the pain and the suffering of the Palestinians. And it, the, the, the article was more of a call for repentance or a wake up call for the evangelical church to look differently at what's happening in Palestine, Israel. And when I, when I sent it to the editor, uh, he wrote me back and he sympathized with the, our struggle and empathize and etc and but he he told me can you please tweak it to make it more pro peace pro reconciliation i didn't mention the word peace in the article but he wanted to insert that word there and when i uh, told him the, the 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 final telos the final aim of the article is surely peace but in this article i want to talk about the pain and the struggle of the palestinians and to make it as a wake up call for the Western church. And when I told him this, when I told him, sorry, I cannot just insert the word peace there, he basically apologized and he told me we cannot publish it. He rejected to publish it. And this is not uh, an isolated case. You know, when, when we as Palestinians, and I would say maybe uh, many other groups uh, from the subaltern, from the majority world, would I think share this experience. When we want to speak about our pain, we're always demanded to speak about peace. Uh, and I would give you examples, a lot of examples from our context. You know, our, our books won't get published, our articles won't get published if we don't speak about peace. Our programs won't get funded if we don't speak about peace. You know, you cannot just open a master program about I don't know, uh, the study of Christian Zionism or justice or et cetera. You need to put the word peace here if you want to attract donors, if you want to, if you want to be listened to. Uh, but if we speak about human rights and justice purely, of course, with the aim of achieving real peace and reconciliation, we are often not listened to, um, unfortunately. Uh, and and this, this actually echoes a, a, a question that, um, a rhetorical question, really that Edward Said, the Palestinian post-colonial critic, and really he's the, the founder of post-colonial studies asked, uh, since when, he, he asked, does a military occupied people have a responsibility for a peace movement? It, I, I, I find it unfortunate that, uh, that oppressed people, uh, people who are uh, occupied, uh, who are uh, crushed, are then uh, demanded, we are demanded to take the responsibility of making peace. You know what I mean? It is like uh, someone gets uh, abused or harassed, and then the first thing that you tell them is that now it's your responsibility to make peace, and not, not, not to make any peace, to make peace with the person who abused you. And immediately, without listening to your pain, to your story, without crying with, with, with you, just you have the responsibility to make peace. <laughs> you know, like, and this is something I, I find it puzzling. Uh, you know, it is like when Peter Tosh, the Jamaican singer, the Jamaican reggae singer sang, everyone is crying out for peace but none is crying out for justice. Everyone wants to use you know, the, the word peace to the degree that we sometimes void it from its real meaning, even within Christian circles. Obviously, Peter Tosh went on in his song and said, I don't want no peace. I need equal rights and justice. I, I would say, because I want peace, I work and advocate for equal rights and justice. And, and I, and I, 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 I I do not need to use the word peace every time I speak about equal rights and every time I speak about justice and, I, and every time I speak about my pain. You know, as a Christian, this is my final telos. This is my goal. God called me to be a peacemaker. But the, the peace of God, the real peace building of God is not a peace that trumps peace, that, that trumps justice and trumps human rights. You know, the, the, this, this kind of peace that is void 
of human rights and void of justice is not a peace that glorifies God. You know, the, the peace that glorifies God is a just peace, is a righteous peace, the kind of peace that vindicates the oppressed and the marginalized rather than further oppress them. It's a kind of peace that uh, hears their stories, their pains, their struggles, not demand from the oppressed to take the responsibility to reconcile with their oppressors. And I think that this is especially important in the context of Palestine, Israel. Uh, last year, the, uh, the, the Palestinian historian uh, Rashid Khalidi, uh, he's an, to be more accurate, he's an American Palestinian. Now he's uh, the Edward Said Chair of Arab Studies in uh, Columbia University. He uh, published a, a very well written book called 100 Years War on Palestine, the 100 Years War on Palestine. And he argued in it that our conflict, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, is unfortunately uh, portrayed at best as a straightforward, if tragic, national clash between two peoples with rights in the same land. Our, you know, even they, they, they call it always the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you know, as if there are two nations equal, you know, fighting over this piece of land. Yalla, as we say in Arabic, let's solve this conflict, you know. The, this is a very misleading analysis of what ha of, of, of the history of the conflict, the so-called conflict. What, uh, what has been going on for the last 100 years is not a national conflict. If you want to use the term conflict, okay, but it is a colonial conflict. There are there are uh, there is a colonial power, one of the most powerful nations in the world now, military and etc., a nuclear power supported by nuclear power, the nuclear powers of the world and the, some of the most powerful nations of the world, the, the US and Europe and etc., oppressing and colonizing and occupying Palestine and wanting to drive the indigenous people of Palestine out. This is what is happening. There is there is a power dynamic here. There is a power imbalance that sometimes we fail to notice. We just put the Palestinians and, and the Israelis on the same side, on the same level, as if there are two groups, two national groups fighting over a piece of land. It's not like, like this. This is not an accurate portrayal of the conflict. It's a colonial conflict. There is a colonizer and a colonized. And the question is, in this colonial context that is still ongoing, as I mentioned previously, Israel is the only country in the world with no declared borders. They are a state in, in continuous expansion. If, if, if you ask Benjamin Netanyahu or any Israeli politician to pinpoint where their borders are, they, they do not have any declared borders. They continuously expand. It's a colonial state that is living. It, it never stops occupying other people's land. And the question is, in this context of colonialism, of colonization, how do we do peace? And in particular, how can the church take its role as an, ang as an agent of, of peace in this particular context of colonization? Beautiful. I think I, I, I want to add to that, that the track record of peace in the Israeli-Palestinian context is very, very negative. I mean, if you look at peace processes started ever since uh, uh, the Nakbe, and for a Palestinian, if you look at all of the peace processes that even in the recent, the Trump peace plan or, or, bef or before that, it, it, it's, it's the a legal way to say we're going to take your land and give you less rights and you have to be okay with it because we're doing it peacefully we're not using violence um a, and so for if you ask a palestinian or an israeli uh person uh they would maybe everyone wants peace but what does peace mean and what does that relate to the other side is completely different uh, and we have to bear in mind that uh, um, you know, Israel has two peace processes with its neighbors, and in peace uh, terminology, these are considered negative peace. That means the, the lack of violence, but, you know, whether it's peace with Egypt or peace with Jordan, there's no relationship. There's no uh, um, uh, cooperation except for let's not fight. But, you know, I don't think this is, this is possible to do uh, with Palestinians because 
as you can see from the map that the Palestinian lives are, are um, and the space, they're so intertwined, you can't really uh, have this negative piece without asking uh, a Palestinian to, not to ask for their same access and equal rights as uh, their, their neighbor. And Tony touched on that as well. There is an imbalance of power. We cannot say that Israelis and Palestinians are equal. So when you want them to come to the negotiations table, you're not talking about two equal entities. You have one side that's super, that's very powerful on all aspects of life. I mean, you know, we can look at the GDP difference between Palestinian and Israeli. Even look at the vaccination right now, what's happening in Israel and Palestine. It's, it's completely one very powerful side with one very weak side. So we can't come and say, let's come and do peace together because this imbalance of power needs to be addressed. And in many ways, that's why we have a third party, but that third party, unfortunately, in the last decade has not been um, a, a neutral. And so already the, it just perpetuates the imbalance of power. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation. I'll give you a story when I, I did believe, uh, I still do believe that Palestinian and Israelis can live together the problem is that there's no willingness uh, uh, by the, the more powerful and the more uh, decision makers who can make uh, who can make the situation better. And so we bring Israelis and Palestinians together. They get to know each other. They form relationships. And one of the one of the groups, um, a person from Bethlehem, had shared that they don't have running water in their house every day. And they said, especially in the summer when it's hot, they actually have less water. And so this person was sharing how they, you know, they don't have enough uh, uh, water uh, for their uh, for their needs. And this Israeli person was moved by the story, and uh, he wanted to help. And so he said, "Okay, I'm going to go talk to my youth group, and we're going to go and buy some bottles of water and give them to this new Palestinian friend I have." And it was commendable for where they where where they were coming from and how they wanted to take action for uh, uh, in the mis the the need of their Palestinian brother have, but it made me think, why not address the issue of lack of water systematically rather than just provide a few bottles of water that are going to be running out in a week or so? And so there is a misunderstanding of what, when we come to peace, to peace, to peace building, we want to change. Palestinians want to change the situation because the more they wait, the more they suffer, the more they are paying the price of uh, this current uh, status quo. Uh, and so there is this sense of urgency that I can't wait till my Israeli counterpart to understand, to uh, get up to date, to understand the context, to realize how much he's benefiting on my expense. Uh, and then once they realize that they want to take action and they, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this sense of urgency that the peace we want, we wanted to address the systematic uh, imbalance of power, imbalance of access to resources, of rights, which consequently affects how we live and, and, and how we can uh, coexist side by side. And Shadia, the, the example that you gave is really powerful because sometimes we, we want to solve injustice by charity. Injustice isn't solved by charity. Injustice is solved by tackling the roots of it, by tackling the roots of oppression and injustice is solved systemically, no? Absolutely. Uh, I do, and sometimes, you know, we want to feel good, so we want to put a Band-Aid on the wound and, you know, here's a little Band-Aid, you can use it, but we want to address why is there a wound? Like, how can we heal this wound from, yeah. from staying rather than just looking at the surface. And I think that's the attractiveness of the word peace is that it sounds great. It's lovely yeah. and everyone it's wants it. But are you willing to pay the price to really reach a peace that is just for both, that is uh, uh, that, that reflects that both sides can live side by side rather than one on the expense of the other? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a word that everyone uses from Donald Trump up to Miss Universe when they ask her, what do you wish? I want world peace, no? So, <laughs> yeah. so we need to uh, really be precise and define what we mean by peace. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for, for me, the, the first challenge is that in this colonial power dynamic, uh, 
the church is taking the wrong side. Rather than standing with the oppressed, the evangelical church in particular stands with Israel, the colonial power. Uh, and not only that, evangelicalism is providing a whole theological system, Christian Zionism, that legitimizes and justifies the ongoing occupation of Palestine, describing it as an act of God, in a way not very different from how Christians justified slavery in the past, slave trade, colonialism in other parts of the world, and all of the, sadly, all of the atrocities that uh, Christians committed in the name of Christ and the Bible. And maybe, maybe Christian Zionism, the, the only difference is, is that it's more complex than other colonial theologies, uh, and it covers a wider range in the church. Uh, there is a liberal Christian Zionist theology, evangelicals have their dispensationalist Christian Zionist theology. So it is, it is uh, I think, a bit more complex than other colonial theologies, but nevertheless, it is uh, used to oppress and to colonize. Uh, the Palestinians. Uh, so for, for me, the, the first challenge is the challenge of theology, is the challenge in particular of Christian Zionism. The church cannot take its agency of peace, cannot fulfill its mission as uh, an, an agent of peace without getting rid of Christian Zionism. I um, I remember it was during one of the uh, uh, beginning of the 2000s, there was war, there was a, a war, Hezbollah was shooting rock, rockets uh, on Israel, and I was in a in Jerusalem, and uh, we were in a prayer group, I, I went with my friend, and you know, at times of war, you you pray, I mean, that's what, what you can do, is, is you sit to pray, and I remember um, I, I was in a small group, and this one of the members started praying very passionately and he said god protect your people israel and do not let these missiles launch and touch them let these missiles go to jordan to uh, to egypt anywhere but to israel and and you know this person was praying and i was i was conflicted because why are we why are we why are we praying are we praying to pr just protect uh, one one group from the other. I mean, why not pray for the, the the stop to stop this? Or why are we praying and not praying enough to peace for all people, uh, for change of heart on both sides? And uh, after the prayer, I, I approached this person and he said, "Well, because this is God's people. This is uh, we are Israel, and God, God will protect them." And I said, "Well, what about the Palestinians? What about the Jordanians? I don't care about them. Like, it's about it's about Israel." And so I think Christian Zionism has really um, created a situation where we as, as Christians, as believers, we are taking sides and we are seeing things in a black and white, uh, uh, in a bl black and white way that it, for me as a Palestinian, it doesn't reflect my understanding of who God is. It doesn't uh, reflect how I see uh, my faith play a role in, in my context. Uh, and I think Christian Zionism places uh, the situation in a very black and white where there's good people and bad people and God is on one side and not on the other side. Uh, and I think simply by being a Palestinian Christian, when you're saying, wait a second, you know, God is not on one side or the other. Uh, God is with justice. God is with, with peace. And where is that? And what does that look like? Um, and so I think um, in many ways, Christian, many people who are not from the from my context, are more familiar with Christian Zionist understanding uh, of the Bible or how to view Israel today. And in many ways, uh, a, when we when I get a chance to go and speak about my experience, my life, uh, I've had situations where I, I just said, hello, my name is Shadia, I'm a Palestinian, and someone just stands up and says, there's no such thing as Palestinian. Uh, or when I went to a, a worship concert and the, uh, organizers recognized everyone there except for Palestinians when they were asked repeatedly there's Palestinians and they just don't care so you have to be careful and mindful that if you if your theology is rejecting uh, or giving you a sense that these people are bad or these are good I think you need to reconsider that theology and look at areas where you can be more informed and more understanding of the context 
I think the best definition um, and the simplest maybe of Christian Zionism is that of Colin Chapman. He uh, defined Christian Zionism simply as the Christian support of Zionism that is based on theological reasons, on Christian theological reasons. Uh, and the, the term Zionism uh, in general, as I mentioned, refers to the Jewish national movement founded by Theodor Herzl in uh, 1897. But at least 60 years prior to Herzl's Jewish Zionist movement, Christians started paving the way for the Jewish colonization of Palestine in what came to be known as Christian Zionism. Some scholars like uh, Stephen Sizer trace the, the origins of Christian Zionism to John Nelson Darby and his dispensation theology that separated church from Israel. And others like Robert Smith, for example, trace it further back to Protestant biblical interpretation of the 16th and 17th centuries. Regardless of the theological and historical roots of Christian Zionism, Christians provided both theological justification and active support for the return of the Jews to Palestine at least since the 19th century, way before the Jewish Zionist movement was founded. Christian support was actually so essential so that, that some argue that if it were not for the activism and commitment of key Christian figures in the 19th century, the modern state of Israel might not have been established. For example, contrary to popular belief, the infamous slogan used by Zionists to colonize Palestine, a land without people for a people without land, was actually first coined by the Christian clergyman in 1843, long before the foundation of the Jewish Zionist movement. This Christian support of Zionism took then a more radical turn after the establishment of Israel in 1948, and especially after the 1967 uh, Six-Day War, uh, which is often remembered by, by Christians as a miracle of God. And Today, for many Christians, especially among evangelicals in the West, they, they simply believe that Zionism and Jewish restoration to Palestine are simply part and parcel of Christianity. That's yeah, for me, I think as someone um, dedicated to, to studying and teaching the scriptures, I see the solution there, or at least I... Uh, uh, infer biblical models to uh, find a way out. And in, and in particular, the, the challenge of Christian Zionism when it comes to the, uh, to the agency of the church and to the mission of the church of peace building, this kind of challenge, the, the, the challenge of theology isn't new. Uh, if you remember in the book of Acts, uh, the church couldn't preach the gospel of peace to the Gentiles until Acts chapter 10. That was the first sermon, the first evangelistic preaching delivered to the Gentiles by Peter in the house of Cornelius. And that, and that incident is very, uh, very interesting because uh, Peter uh, specifically says uh, that he is proclaiming uh, the peace you know, the peace that comes by Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 10. I come to you preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. But what's interesting in the story, that before Peter could preach about peace to the Gentiles, an internal theological transformation that's actually key to the history, to the history of the church and mission. You know, we're not talking just about a uh, biblical text and uh, isolated biblical text. This is a crucial moment in the history of mission and in the history of the church that before Peter could preach the gospel of peace to Cornelius and his household, a theological transformation needed to happen. And what happened is two things, actually. Uh, God had to change his theology proper, the way he understands God, and he had to change the way he looks at the other before he could preach peace to the other. So when Peter enters into the house of Cornelius, if you remember the story, first, uh, God shows him that, and this is Peter speaking, God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. 
And to understand this, we need to understand a bit of the context of uh, what was going on there. The, the, the early Christians, the Jewish Christians in the first century, we, we like to, uh, we, we like it or not, they had a kind of an ethnocentric theology that views God as the God of the Jews, and they are the chosen people of God, and other people are outside, other people are profane, are impure, and are, are unclean. So in order uh, for, uh, to, for, for Peter to be able to preach the gospel of peace to those people, God needed to change the way he looked at those people, you know, the way he looked at the other, not as less, not as unclean, not as in, impure, but as equal. And the book of Acts says, the uh, book of Acts elsewhere in Acts 17, uh, 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 the, the, the others, the non-Christians are actually described as God's children by Paul in Acts 17. So that view of the other needed to change first, the way he looked at the other. And second, when he started, just before he started preaching the gospel in the house of Cornelius, Peter, the, the text says, then Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So basically what, what, what's happening here is that his theology, his theology proper, the way he understands God, needed to be changed from, a, from an ethnocentric view of God, an ethnocentric understanding of God as a God of favoritism, as a God who prefers one people over the other, to a God that is inclusive, that welcomes everyone, regardless of their blood, regardless of their color, regardless of their race. So these two things that are in the core of the, of the theology of the church needed to be transformed. Their theology need, needed to be deconstructed, if you want to use modern terms. Their theology needed to be deconstructed and transformed. They, can, they, they couldn't have preached the gospel and be peacemakers and peace proclaimers without transforming the way they look at the other and the way they understood God. Only then, and, and the, the text is very clear, this, all of this happened before, and only then Peter could preach the gospel of peace. So the, 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 the way out or a way out to Christian Zionism is the deconstruction of this theology, is the transformation of this theology. Our God is inclusive. He does not distinguish. And Peter says it clearly 2,000 years ago. The church discovered this. The, the church had, had this theology 2,000 years ago. I now realize 2,000 years ago that God does not show favoritism. That's the solution to Christian Zionism. It's as simple as this. We need to go back to our simple, to our orthodox Christian doctrine, you know, and our orthodox gospel. And the, the second challenge, the challenge of context, uh, for me, I, I, I find a very good model, and this is the paper actually that I shared last year uh, in our consultation back in 2019, uh, the, past infinite consultation, is that I find the model to the second challenge in the wisdom tradition of the Bible. And why the wisdom tradition? Because unlike other biblical books, the wisdom tradition, the, the, the epistemology of the wisdom books is very empirical. I look, I see, I see how the ant walks and I deduct from, the, from there with my God-inspired mind, you know. Uh, uh, I see and I learn from experience, from what I see in front of me. And in, and in particular, the, the uh, book of Ecclesiastes is very big on this. Like the, the word see, ra'a in Hebrew is repeated in the book of Ecclesiastes 47 times. The guy just goes around and sees things, you know, and he learns from it. Now, unfortunately, some scholars and among them evangelical scholars, they don't think that the core of the book, you know, what uh, you know, what uh, Kohelet, the, the, the preacher or the teacher speaks in the core of the book is something normative. They, uh, they say that the normative message of the book is in, in its epilogue, which basically destroys 
all of the core of the book. This is what, what they argue. Why? Because the, the book depends so much, the epistemology of the book is so much based on, uh, on, on an empirical method. You know, I see, I see, I experience, and I deduct. So they claim, they argue, that actually the whole canonical value of the book, the whole normative message of the book, that this epistemology is not the way. You know, God does not want us to use the empirical epistemology, he wants us to use more revelatory epistemology that is based on a, a revelation from God or what he says, the truth that is rooted on God. But I would argue otherwise. This empirical epistemology is rooted on God, you know. It's Kohelet, it's the teacher or in the book of Ecclesiastes, he's using his mind and his eyes to see. And what's interesting in our discussion is that what he sees and among the core things that he sees is injustice, you know? And, uh, 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 and what, what is striking for me is the way that he analyzes injustice. Just if, if we can show these two verses on uh, the screen from uh, the end of chapter three of Ecclesiastes and the beginning of chapter four, allow me to read them from the NRSV edition. Kohelet says, the teacher, moreover, I saw under the sun that in place of justice, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, wickedness was there as well. I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Look the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power with no one to comfort them. Now, unfortunately, many Western commentators are quick to declare that here Kohelet is only descriptive. You know, here the text is only descriptive. Kohelet just notices injustice and oppression, but he doesn't do anything about them. But if you dig a little bit deeper, what Kohelet is doing here is tremendous. Kohelet here is understanding the cause of oppression and injustice. In, he, he says specifically the, the, the reason for the, for the injustice is clearly, is explicitly mentioned in the text. It is not the sin of the oppressed. You know, Kohelet, unlike us, does not point to the oppressed and tell them it is your sin that you are being oppressed. Rather, like an intellectual with penetrating analysis, he recognizes the power imbalance between the oppressor and the oppressed as the cause of the affliction of the downtrodden. On the side of their oppressors, there was power. And he also understands that this is part of a bigger system of oppression or a hierarchy of power, which goes all the way up to the king himself. And he says this clearly in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and right, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by higher, and there are yet a higher ones, higher ones over them. This oppressive hierarchy of powers for Kohelet, for the teacher, the preacher, is the cause of the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and right. So from the, what, what I'm trying to say is, is that from the wisdom tradition, from our wisdom tradition, because it's so empirical, it grounds us, it puts us on planet earth. It helps us open our eyes, see injustice and analyze it for what it is. So I think there are biblical models that uh, provide a way out for the challenge of Christian Zionism, basically the deconstruction of ethnocentric theologies and their transformation into an inclusive Christ-centered theology. And, set, and second, our, the wisdom, the biblical wisdom tradition provides us a wealth, provides a wealth of insight on how we should look and analyze what is happening in front of our eyes. I think for me, and this is one of the most difficult questions to ask because, again, um, I think very grounded in my theology and, and my understanding of what God's mission for us is here and how we are to be peacemakers and, and to advocate for peace with justice, with uh, uh, equality. But on the other hand, reality is very harsh. Reality is always stomping you down, and and I think you you know personally for me, you know how do you move forward? How do you keep going, um, and to balance uh, our theology of hope, but a reality of hopelessness? And there's always this um, this challenge to navigate these two uh, 
um, especially as things um, seem to be regressing um, on top of the, the current situation. Um, and I think partly it's also, you know, I'm saying that on one hand, but I also acknowledge that uh, we are people that is, that is known for its perseverance. We keep going, um, you know, living under empires is part of our, who we are, and we've managed to kind of survive throughout it. So we have that history um, and that, that traditional wisdom of how to keep going, especially when things are difficult. And I think it's also partly where I am right now. I'm kind of trying to, I'm, I'm studying more into indigenous theology and trying to kind of learn, you know, how to be, um, how to understand uh, marginal theology. Where's the power in that, the inspiration of that um, and take it into my context. And, and I think, you know, just from this, some of the, the work that I try to think about is uh, Palestinian tradition is so rich and it's so um, uh, so beautiful with how much it's it speaks about connection to the land, connection between the people, um, especially the way uh, our my matriarchal ancestry uh, told stories through embroidery, through food. I mean, there's so much richness, richness there. And I think, you know, my... Um, uh, my learning of indigenous theological lens has helped me see that. And I think that gives a lot of hope, that gives a lot of inspiration um, to continue that legacy, to continue uh, telling stories. And, and it's partly, I think this is an area that I've been very passionate about. Um, and I've been involved in, in many of my uh, experiences to tell stories because everyone has a story to tell and that's important and it's very powerful. Uh, and one of the examples is the uh, a podcast that I co-produced uh, with two of my friends that we wanted uh, to hear Palestinian Christian women's experiences and how they experienced the conflict, uh, how they uh, how they intersected with their gender and and their faith. And so it's lovely, uh, you know, thirty minutes of storytelling of different women, different. Um, uh, different situations of life and how they navigate uh, their context. Um, and I, I would encourage you to kind of, if you want more stories, more areas to connect, to understand where people come from, especially the complexity uh, of the, the Palestinian context, stories help give you an entry point to that. Uh, but it's not the end point, it's only the beginning. Um, and, and I think another way forward is to also keep in mind that um, I remind myself that I'm, we shouldn't be result oriented, but journey oriented, right? It's not just, we, it's not just seeing, um, seeing peace or wanting to get, if I don't see peace, then it's not happening, but have faith that it's the journey and each one of us has a role to play, a role to do, and God takes care of the full picture and kind of do our things. But it's very, it's very challenging. Uh, it's very hard, especially especially hope. I think keeping hope going, it's a daily decision and it's something that's very real because I'm sure you have similar experiences. You turn on the news and it's all bad news. And so how do you, how do you keep going? Uh, but I think it's also, we have the tools for that. We have the theology that helps us inform our knowledge about how to move forward. Wow, that was really powerful. I um, I continue to meditate on on just a phrase that Shadia shared: a uh, balance of theology of hope with a reality of hopelessness. Um, and thank you, Nina, for sharing uh, this quote. I think in in the the chat, hope is nothing without its daughters, angers, and anger and courage. So at this point, we have some time, um, about 35 minutes from Augustine. Sorry, Nina added that that quote was from Augustine. We have some time, about 35 minutes, to jump into question and answer. Uh, we have both Shadi and Tony with us. Um, and we just want to have a, a chance to explore these questions more deeply with each of them. So um, as you process what you've just heard, please send in your comments, your questions in the chat, um, and then we'll We'll share those um, and ha have a chance to hear Shadi and Tony respond. 
Um, and just to get us started as you all are thinking and, and sending in your, your own questions, um, you talk about the, the reality of Palestine today is the reality of a currently colonized people, a currently colonized land. How do you speak about peace building? How do you think about peace and um, maybe what, what would that even look like in that colonized context for either of you? Chad, do you want to start or is it a go, question? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is a question that we all battle with. Uh, colonization is still ongoing. It's a reality. We can't go from one city to another unless we pass by three, four checkpoints and get uh, checked by the Israeli military. Uh, the, the Israeli settlements are in continuous expansion. This is a reality on the ground. And uh, how do we speak about peace building with this reality? I think for me, the uh, simple answer is this, re this colonization needs to stop first. Uh, before anyone can uh, talk about peace or reconciliation, it is as simple as that. And when it comes to the role of the church, it's even more problematic because the church, and actually with uh, all of its spectrum, you, you've got the liberals and the evangelicals, the church carries a colonial imperial theology that justifies what is going on in the ground. So it is better for the church either to go out from the equation totally, uh, which makes it better, or this theology needs to be uh, deconstructed and transformed fully uh, in order for the church to be able to be an agent of peace. Obviously, my uh, courage comes from this quote of uh, Nina, but. Uh, that needs to be said. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, um, you know, when, when I when I worked in in the field, it was much easier to uh, recruit and um, bring in uh, people who are from my own faith group because our theology invites uh, is about reconciliation, right? It's about peace. We look at the model of Christ and we say, you know, would you like to come with me to a an event where we meet fellow uh, uh, believers from the Israeli side. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is kind of, this is our tool. This is where we, this is because for primarily evangelical uh, um, Palestinians, this is a very strong uh, incentive to come, not because of the context, but despite the context, we are called to reconcile so many come. However, as you kind of go into the process, slowly you realize that the theology that invited you is also the same uh, theology that's going to divide the conversation. Because, um, you know, for different reasons, and each one comes from a different context, but the way we read the Bible and the way we understand the Bible, we cannot, uh, we seem to struggle to demystify um, um, certain words that we associate with reality without thinking twice, you know, look at our, uh, the stories of the Bible. So, you know, once you read it and you are put in one side or the other, and for us, it's kind of hard because if we read the Bible and, and we interpret Israel as the modern Israel today, then that means Palestinians are Israel's enemies and you're kind of automatically put on the other side. And so, you know, if you follow the rationale, so I've come to do peace building because because Jesus brought me into this, He's called me to reconcile. But now the same Bible that I that invited me is also being used against me, and I'm put on the wrong side. I'm put on. I'm the incarnation of evil uh, of God's people, and so it's really hard to to um, maybe talk about peace building in that setting without deconstructing and challenging this dual very binary narrative that we have kind of adapt, ad adopted without even questioning. And, and I think in many ways as, as Palestinians, um, and this is something that we have learned to do so uh, quickly, especially as we are engaged with peace building, is to question this narrative because there's something wrong um, in this binary mindset of good and evil being so a clear set on both sides. Thank you. 
Yeah, we have a question from Nina Balmaceda. She wanted to um, share that out loud. Are you with us, Nina? Go ahead. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much, Shadia and Tony, for teaching us, for leading our reflection. Um, I, I do have a question and a comment. Let me start with the comment first, how interesting it is how in, in contexts of deep injustice, which you know, the case of Palestine is like paradigmatic. We have weaponized words, right? And I want to address one of those words, forgiveness. In a previous session, another great session that we had in this forum, Tony was asking the speakers about who has the right to demand, uh, who, who should forgive? I think it was Tony's question. And I kept thinking about this because I was obviously not satisfied with the answer we got. Yes, we need a disposition to forgive those who, who harm us following the example of Christ. But it's from a perspective on restorative justice, only those who have been harmed have the right to forgive. So what is the responsibility from everyone else in the context of the Palestinian case, for example, or looking at my sister Hokabed here in the context of the terrible injustice committed against indigenous populations in the Americas, or, you know, and we go case by case. What is our responsibility? I don't think Christians have the responsibility to forgive those that oppress others. Our responsibility is to advocate for justice, so that those that are oppressed stop being oppressed and therefore they are allowed to consider forgiveness. Amen. And here my question, <laughs> this is just, you know, anger speaking, but honestly, I am so tired of white evangelical predominant theology. By the way, I wanted also to mention that in my experience living in the United States, what we describe as evangelical, <sighs> really describes more like what we call white evangelicalism. I have found that African-American theology is much more nuanced. So here's my question, sorry for making it too long. If this statement that no one but those who are suffering have the right to forgive the others and our responsibility is different, how would you please instruct us so that we can take even baby steps to advocate for justice regarding Palestine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. I mean, you uh, you spoke all of our anger and our heart, really. Like, I'm uh, almost in tears because this, uh, we keep saying this, but it's very, very, very hard for, the, for other brothers and sisters, Christians in the West to understand. You know, we cannot, it seems we cannot speak about injustice. We cannot speak about oppression. We need to just speak about peace before speaking about our pain, before challenging colonial theologies, before doing anything else. And th thank you so much for uh, resonating with our hearts and allowing us to speak with this anger, you know, this unfiltered anger. We always need to filter it, to put 10 filters to, to be able to speak. Um, with regards to your question, let me start by saying what I always say. I think, and this is what is hurtful the most to me, when people ask me, where is your hope? My simple answer is the church. <laughs> this is how I interpret the Bible. Where else can hope be? If Jesus left us as salt and light, this is the, the light. There is no other light, according to the New Testament, at least. This light is not shining. This light, <laughs> you know, is, is causing the damage. And this is where our frustration comes from. The church needs to take its role as light and salt in the world with good words, with action, with, with, with basically the, the church is the moral compass of the world. You know, the, the church is the community, the alternative humanity who tells the world this is right and this is wrong. This is righteousness, this is justice, and this is wickedness. Now, if we lost our ability, if we lost our moral compass, this is the catastrophe, when the church loses its moral compass. So I think advocacy starts by recognizing what is true, what is false, 
what is righteousness, what is wickedness, and standing, taking the side, and, un, and unashamedly I say it, a side needs to be taken. There is no objectiveness here in cases of colonization and oppression, me standing in the middle and trying to put the abuser and the abused together. I need to take side. And I need to take side, to, I, I need to take the side of the oppressed. It's as simple as this, the narrative of the oppressed I choose, not the narrative of the oppressor. We, we know from post-colonial thinkers that all historical narratives, uh, all historiography is in the end of the interpretation. So there is the Israeli Zionist powerful interpretation with all their evidence and professors and Harvard PhDs arguing for it. And you've got the Palestinian narrative of my, my grandma, which one <laughs> do you want to choose? You need to pick a narrative. Of course, you use your brain and your logic and your criteria and whatever you want, but you are in the end, you will make a choice. The safest choice is to stand by the side of the oppressed. I, I can't see any other model uh, in the Bible but this. You know, like the liberation theologians, what, what they say, God takes the side of the poor. That's my uh, answer. I don't know what you all think. Shadi, maybe have a... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good, uh, good question. And I, I mean, I'll probably keep on thinking about it. But, um, um, you know, for me, and, and maybe it is still influenced by, you know, it, rightly so, you said the right white evangelicals. And this is something that I'm trying to kind of put my finger around it, especially in, in my current studies. Um, because when working uh, in my practice work as, as, as um, in reconciliation, it seems like we rush to talk about forgiveness without acknowledging what has what is the wrongdoing and who is responsible for the wrongdoing. And I think it's also a tendency for, for our, for our uh, uh, faith to kind of remain on the solution oriented rather than addressing um, the suffering and pain that comes as a result of injustice. So where we, you know, we look, we jump on the suffering of Christ and Easter and we want to jump to the resurrection, but we don't necessarily contemplate um, a, which you mentioned about lamenting, you know, last uh, in, in your session. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm always worried about that because history repeats itself. And, you know, Miroslav Wolf, I think in, in, one, in one of his books said, you know, be careful that when you pursue justice that you don't become unjust and be careful when you uh, pr pursue truth that you become untruthful. Um, and so what is that balance? I, you know, when we advocate, and we have to be careful is that if we are advocating for uh, justice, that we don't be unjust towards those who think are the perpetrators. So it's this balance between, yes, Palestinians are suffering and they are, and they need to be, uh, uh, they need justice, but let's not fall into that justice for Palestinians means injustice for Israelis. So this is not the solution, right? So how do we keep that? balance it and you know I don't have an, an answer other than this uh, um, uh, we need to keep in mind both sides when we talk about uh, justice and forgiveness and how that blends in together it's a very uh, good question and I think Tony touched on that a bit but thank you thank you for that question sounds like a question that we'll need to continue coming back to I mm -hmm. really appreciate mm -hmm. your both your willingness to to dig in a little bit here. Um, I missed a question from earlier from uh, Ted, um, who's with us originally from Ghana, now studying in Seoul. Um, Ted shares that he has uh, been the typical evangelical African position holder on Israel until recently that he visited Israel from the perspective mm -hmm. of Palestinians. Um, and he asked the question, how can we bridge the evangelical tension on the issue? And um, yeah, maybe you can also add a little bit for, unfortunately, the many, many communities here in Latin America, in Africa and different parts of the world who unfortunately have only heard one side um, and have never, you know, really made, befriended anyone to, to clarify these, uh, the narratives. Yeah, I think if I can just uh, jump in on that, I mean, you know, that's a very good point. And I think that's part of advocacy. That's part of uh, our, our work as 
as we engage with our others, that we become their ambassadors, we become their spokesperson, and in any opportunity that is possible, we kind of uh, share our experience. Because I think uh, no one can argue with your personal experience and what you have seen, as opposed to what you think. And so I think it's important that you have become Ted, our ambassador, whether uh, you intend it or not, and in some ways for your community uh, to share your experience. And this is something that Palestinian Christians always say, come and see, right? Uh, we are the living stones and it makes a big difference that when you come and I think that there's a higher likelihood that you would come to the Holy Land as opposed to us coming to, to you and uh, as you come for your pilgrimage um, consider those living there consider the local the local Christians that are there uh, and come and visit them and make an effort um, and in some ways um, this is the, the biggest uh, advantage we have in, in, in our context is that we do have brothers and sisters who come and, and, and visit us. Um, and it's also about your entry point. I think, how do you, how are you, how do you know about the context, you know, and usually it's through personal relationships. And in some ways, you know, whether it's the podcast or knowing going to a conference and meeting a Palestinian, that's what makes us that's what humanizes the conflict and the context for us and in, in any context. So when I know you, I know who you are, I know more about your context and in the same way. So I would encourage possible, you know, opportunities to speak on behalf of Palestinians or invite Palestinians to uh, related conferences or events that you think would be good. And of course you take people where they are and you know your context best, so how to challenge uh, some of the perceptions and some of the views, you know, it's a gradual process. Um, but, our, you know, this is something that we all have invested our lives in. This is what we do. We kind of try to um, challenge the status quo by telling our stories, by telling our perspective. Uh, and so that's, I think, the, the strongest tool that, that we can use and utilize. Yeah, I think that's a... Uh... A question that bothers me a lot living here in uh, Latin America. I mean, the church next door, literally, the other day I was like standing there five minutes trying to rub my eyes to make sure I see correctly. The flag of Israel, the church next door, has a flag of Israel, a huge flag of Israel, flying there beside the cross. I mean, I'm in Latin America, in Cochabamba. <laughs> and, and like, I, I keep asking myself, why? What is this? And it's it's a it's a very complex question, and uh, you know uh, one needs maybe to uh, tackle it at the monograph level. You know uh, the the roots of it. Where does it come wh from? From where does it come? But I think uh, one place that it comes from is the missionary attitude. You know where did dispensationalism come from? Where why in uh, the seminary here in La Paz, in Bolivia, they still have as their required reading the Schofield Reference Bible of the early 20th century. The standard Christian Zionist Bible is still the standard Bible in that seminary. Here in, in the seminary in uh, Cochabamba, the, the, the person who teaches Revelation is a dispensationalist graduate of Moody. And he comes here and he was working as the uh, academic dean here, uh, and he is teaching uh, dispensationalism. And the problem with this is that, sorry, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone, but the missionary comes with an attitude, with, with this what Edward Said calls the, the, the uh, perpetual student or perpetual uh, pupil. You, the global south, we, the global south people, we are always the student and the missionary comes always to teach us and to feed us. And the missionary comes both one with a very, I would say, uh, a, a hermeneutic that is removed from humility. So uh, he thinks or she thinks that they have the pure, uh, uh, original, pure, true meaning of the text that is interpreted without any acknowledgement of the locatedness of the interpreter. And they come from position of privilege and power to teach the pobrecitos of Latin America or Africa or etc. Not to dialogue, not to pilgrim with, with them. This missionary model needs to be questioned. 
And even the word mission, you opened Oxford, the Oxford English Dictionary, the word mission still, uh, uh, notwithstanding all of the, all of the uh, 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 contributions from the Global South, from René Padilla and Samuel Escobar and, 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 still mission is from the West to the rest in theology, in attitudes, in, uh, and the, the model itself, the missionary model needs to be questioned and transformed also to a more a pilgrimage model where the, 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 the brother or the sister comes to walk with us, not as teachers and we are the pupils to teach us. You know, uh, I, I think this is very, very problematic. And I think this is the source why many in Palestine itself, the evangelical church, is dispensationalist, is fundamentalist. And I say it with tears in my eyes. That's why many of us young people are going away from the evangelical church. Who can stand to stay in such church? Because it's under the influence of missionaries. So this needs to be questioned. Hmm. Tony, I think uh, we need to read that monograph article. <laughs> You can prepare for us. No, I mean, thank you. Um, we have some really, really exciting questions. I'm, I'm looking forward to dig in here as well. So I'm, I'm just going to move quickly. Um, Hoka Ben, um, our dear friend from the Kuna Nation in Panama, has shared. She'd like to little, know a little bit more from you, Shadia, about what you mentioned briefly in your in your interview um, about the um, embroideries and the memories of your grandmothers, your ancestor, your matriarchal family tree, about how they understand peace, uh, forgiveness, reconciliation. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think, you know, my exploration into my heritage is as a result of my evangelical upbringing that disconnected me from that same heritage uh, because of uh, what we are familiar with in our context that we have to be, we, we have to distinguish ourselves from this world. And so uh, part of uh, my current uh, paper that I'm doing is looking at uh, traditional ways or traditional expressions of a connection to the land. And one of those, which is similar in many other uh, indigenous contexts, is embroidery or using uh, uh, beads and, and whatnot, to, you know, to express um, to express that form in their own context. And when I was looking at the uh, uh, at the information, and you know, I think if you meet Palestinians, especially women, if it's any context, you would see that they would be wearing uh, their embroidered uh, clothes, whether it's a dress or a shirt that now they've kind of changed into a modern dress. Um, and so when I looked into these elements, I found a lot of storytelling in in them, uh, and and they all they all where this kind of unspoken communication by the matriarchal side of my heritage. Um, um, the, um, you know, how they made the embroidery, it was, uh, un unfortunately, a lot of it stops, you know, at the Nekbi because it changed and altered life significantly, a little bit even before that under the British, um, uh, under the British empire, but, the symbolism of the icon, the, the images that they used, the story that they would tell, um, it was celebrating nature, celebrating the surrounding. Um, I'm trying to think of if I can give you an example uh, that that um, is used, but um, you know the Star of Bethlehem is is in there, but it's also called uh, the Moon in other contexts. In Hebron, for example, they would call it a moon. Um, but these are again examples of ways that um, my heritage talked about how we related to the land in a way that was in harmony, in a way that kind of acknowledged what we received from the land, but also how we are uh, uh, in giving back to that land. So in that sense, there is that peace and reconciliation in that sense that was uh, living in harmony with our um, uh, surrounding. And more, you know, and another element that's very important is that most of these traditions were done by village women and not necessarily urban uh, because their life was less disturbed in that sense. They didn't have as much interaction with 
uh, uh, pilgrims or, or Westerners. And so it's interesting to look at these elements, even the Palestinians' kufiye, um, which is also really, that was the symbol that the farmers used to protect them when, when working in the field. And so a lot of the symbols that became Palestinian, the national, the national resistance or national symbols are actually the symbols of the village uh, rural side of uh, society. Um, so there's something I think very powerful and very profound is that we are even using our traditional wisdom into our context now uh, to symbolize resistance, to symbolize the sumud of the Palestinians. Wow. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring together two questions from Ben, Ben Korshi with us from Ghana. Um, I think maybe um, maybe you can answer these in some quick kind of data points. He asked first, how much the false claim that Palestinians are all Muslims is a factor in perpetuating the status quo? How much is on that, that on the one side. And then on the other side, the elections in Israel, are they relevant to the Palestinian search for justice? And if not, how could they be made so? Oh, I think for the, the, the one regarding um, the, the, pre, the misunderstanding is that all Palestinians are Muslim. I mean, I, I think, yes, I mean, this is usually even uh, when I uh, travel and speak, many, um, many uh, Christians assume that I've con at some point my family converted. Um, and so there is kind of a misinformation or, or less familiarity that about the Christians that uh, Christians are in the Middle East in general. Um, and so, but I think that really feeds into a larger narrative of the conflict being a, um, a, a you know, clash of civilization or religious uh, uh, conflict. And so I think many times when this, this question comes up, you know, uh, the, the bigger question is what, what narrative is it trying to reflect? Because is it that, you know, it's a, a Jew-Muslim uh, or Judah-Christian and Muslim uh, conflict. And in that case, you know, what does that mean? And, and you know, and, and, but, but, you know, for me, what does it, it, you know, my existence as a Palestinian Christian and my experience of injustice shows that this conflict is not a religious based on your religion, but it is a colonial conflict because it's about uh, one group uh, um, who has more access and more rights than the other group. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I mean, this is a very legitimate, a very relevant important question that comes up quite often, especially when talking about uh, the context from a Christian perspective. Um, maybe just starting before you go about elections. Yes, today is the fourth election in, in Israel after in, in the last two years. Um, unfortunately, you know, it, it, with the Israeli election, it just kind of reflects an, um, um, a, t a bit of a of a, st a stuck uh, context because you know they keep repeating elections because the government has has not maintained consensus. But the problem is they keep repeating it and they almost get the same results every now you know every every time because there's no alternative to lead to the current leadership. And I'm sure uh, you know in, in some ways the Palestinians have the same struggle. Is this, the leadership right now is is not challenged and there's no alternative for the current leadership. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I, I, I can I can vote as an as a, as Israeli citizen um, in the election. If you look at some of the campaigns in the uh, um, no one talks about peace uh, in Israel. I mean, it's not even on the agenda. No one's interested in it. It doesn't. If anything, I think it, it for the majority Israeli population, if you talk about peace, that's probably not a good idea to gain more public uh, support. So that also resonates, that speaks a lot about the context and to what degree peace is a priority and, and relevant to the current status quo. Yeah, I think that the first question, if I can comment quickly, I think it is part of it, but also like uh, thinking that all the Palestinians are Muslims, I mean, like uh, Shadi said, some, some people don't know that we even exist. And they asked us, when uh, did you convert? But also, how uh, I, I think part of the problem also is how we look at Muslims. Uh, 
We always, when it comes to Palestine and Israel, we always remember Hamas, the terrorist bombings, the violence. We associate them with ISIL, with ISIS, Islamic terrorism. Uh, and this blinds us from seeing the uh, power imbalance, the, the oppression, the, the etc. And uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, we, we treat Islamic extremism like this is the, um, like th this is the representation of all Muslims in every culture, in every, like, like in the world of the New Testament, there were the zealots, militants. They were the minority of the minority of the people, of the Jewish people of Palestine in the first century. Similar, Hamas, ISIS. I mean, ISIS, well, how, how many ISIS fighters? 80,000, 100,000 from 400 million Arabs. I, 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 Muslims are normal human beings. You know, there are, they have their struggles, their pains, there are not all militants and they want to butcher the Christians. You know, some of my best friends are Muslims. Some of the people, when, when I came back to Palestine with my wife, the first people who invited us and offered hospitality were my Muslim friends more, more than my Christian friends. So I think that's also part of the equation, how we look at Muslims. And the, the question on Israeli elections, basically, for, for me, honestly, I don't have hope from uh, this, uh, this election. Like uh, Benny Gantz on the center left or Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, when it comes to us, the Palestinians, they compete. Their, their election uh, campaigns are a competition of who want to oppress and support the settlements, who want to, op to oppress the Palestinians more and, and support the Palestinians more. No one wins on the ticket of human rights for the Palestinians. So the similar question is that, no, I don't have hope from Israeli elections. <sighs> I come back to that theology of hope in the midst of a reality of hopelessness when I hear things like that. And the reality of difficult, corrupt elections across our world. Um, I want to share with you a comment that Stephanie shared. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and translate it uh, as best I can verbally. Uh, she shares that, um, talking, going off a little bit of what Shadi was sharing earlier about the embroidery. In our Andean cultures, there are expressions very similar to the ones that you mentioned, Shadi. And women are um, very key in transmitting um, knowledge and reclaiming identity and this is viewed um, this is made visible in the um, agri agricultural dynamics because um, in the Andes uh, Ecuadorans are still um, still maintain the link between their identity and agriculture um, so very, thank you very much for sharing your experiences of this um, from Palestine um, I think that our forms of resistance through weaving threads are, are very similar. And in the case of um, Afro descendants in um, Andean countries, you can also find forms of resistance in their hairstyles, um, just like the weaving and, and embroidery are um, elements, cultural elements of reclaiming and resistance in uh, Colombian Caribbean, for example, um, this is also present in braids and in um, hairstyles in the um, hair of our uh, African sisters. So thank you very much for, for sharing that stuff. I thought that was a kind of a beautiful image to share and to also um, leave with Shadi and Tony. Um, so we're getting close to, uh, to the end of our time. Um, and so uh, we won't quite close yet. Maybe I'll give you both a chance to share um, in a couple, uh, a minute or two, what would you, um, as your brothers and sisters from around the world, uh, what would you most desire for from us, from infinite, from the infinite community, um, to be um, responsible advocates, uh, pursuers of justice, um, you know, send, sowing those seeds of of eventual um, hope, peace um, in your country? What, what would that look like for, for us, you think? I, I think, um, um, thank you for the, I mean, it should be stated, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, to come and to speak and to kind of share 
our opinions and our hearts without really um, a, giving, you know, without placing any filters on us. I mean, it's so important in so many contexts that Tony mentioned, like we, if we get opportunities to speak, it's usually in such a small uh, confined uh, window uh, to be able to do that. Um, but uh, I think, again, just as much as, you know, coming here and sharing you guys, um, all the speakers that have come so far in an infinite, it's such a rich conversation. Um, you know, just a small example, like with what Stephanie shared, that we, we share so much in common um, that in some ways, uh, the encouragement is um, uh, coming from both sides. Um, and I think, you know, um, I would say, keep doing what you're doing, invite us, uh, uh, speak on our behalf. And if there's any opportunities um, to speak, you know, and to uh, advocate for justice for Palestinians and, and Israelis, do that. And we are, um, we are, we are very happy to give you information, support, anything that is needed, as well as our time and, and presence as well. Yeah. I think I echo what uh, Shadi said. I mean, this is a forum where we can be angry, uh, like uh, Nina opened us. <laughs> we can uh, speak uh, with raw voices without being filtered. Uh, I mean, my experience since uh, 2010, since I switched to full-time ministry, has been just being filtered again and again and again and again. And this is a place where we can speak and, when, where, and, and where we can share our struggle with people who understand it in a profound level. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so, so much for this opportunity. And uh, let's continue this conversation. Well, thank you both. Um, it's been wonderful to to be here together today. Um, and one of those things that you you've talked about is is just making sure that that we are sharing. I know that um, both of you gave us some resources for uh, further information. We've talked about the podcast "Women Behind the Wall." Um, Jeffrey today in the chat shared a link as well. So all of those things we can also make sure to continue to circulate in our emails um, during, but also beyond this forum. And we'll, we'll look forward to doing that with you all. Um, so in the final uh, couple of minutes, um, I wanna share some quick announcements and then close us in prayer. Um, as hopefully you all know, uh, those of you who are still with us, we have a uh, opportunity to continue our conversations now, um, not just hearing from Tony and Shadia, but actually reflecting, um, processing together in a couple of dialogue sessions. Um, those are in uh, just about a half an hour from now um, at 1600 GMT. And then uh, later on today, uh, although it'll be technically tomorrow, depending on where you are, if you're in the Eastern he Hemisphere. But uh, for me, it's it's later on today. Um, it would be 7 p.m. in Bogota or Central Time. Um, so uh, if you are able to join us, we'd love to have you for those. We'll be in Spanish and English for the later one, hoping that many of our brothers and sisters from Latin America can also join us for that. So uh, we look forward to continuing these conversations, um, but the end of the, the closing session of, of Stop Bediaco Forum, at least um, this iteration, this moment will be this Thursday. Um, so we also hope that you'll join us for that. Um, and that is at the same time uh, we met today, 1400 GMT. Um, and we look forward to, to just closing with some time to share with one another, reflect and respond um, as we move forward together. So thank you all. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end us in a world at word of prayer. Um, first, maybe inviting us to 15, 30 seconds of, of silence as we just let this sink in what we've heard today, and then I'll close this off. God, you are the one who gives us hope in a reality of hopelessness. You are the one who accompanies our brothers and sisters in Palestine 
who have been um, seeds of, of resistance, who have maintained their um, pride, their identity, their culture, um, their courage in the midst of, of such difficult circumstances, um, not just in the last um, 100, 200 years, but but through a whole history of, of colonization. And we ask specifically for our brothers and sisters in, in Palestine that you would continue uh, to give them strength, to give them hope, and to help us as brothers and sisters around the globe to um, be responsible advocates um, and willing to work for justice. God, we ask you to give each of us the strength and the passion for the work of, of justice, um, the courage and anger that underlie um, that go with the peace that we we so want. Um, and not be afraid of, of all of the implications of that. Um, God, we don't want a shallow peace. We want your shalom for this world. And we, we lament the issues, um, the corruption, the um, ongoing colonization of indigenous Palestinians, as well as um, indigenous people across the world. We ask you as we continue to come get together through these conversations that you would show us um, how to listen well um, and allow us to reread your word through the, the eyes um, and the stories of our brothers and sisters, especially those who've been marginalized. We love you, Lord, and we ask you to um, go with each of us through the rest of our days and bring us back together again as we continue to discuss um, and respond together. We love you and we thank you. Amen. It's good to be with you all. Thank you. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Tori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank thank you everyone. Thank you. Good to see you here. Bye-bye. God bless.